It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Ben Zorn as our 2016 keynote speaker. Ben is a research manager and a principal researcher at Microsoft Research. He co-leads a group of over 30 researchers and developers called RISE, Research in Software Engineering. Before moving to Microsoft, Ben received his PhD from UC Berkeley and was a professor at the University of Colorado. Ben has been program chair for PLDI in 1999 and general chair in 2010. He's also served as associate editor for both ACM 12 Plus and PACO. He served on the SIG Plan Executive Committee and the ACM Software Systems Award Committee. He's currently a member of the CRA Council called the Computing Community Consortium, CCC. And today, he's going to tell us all about the programming languages and their technical disruption. Please welcome Dr. Ben Zorn. So first of all, I want to say thank you to Chandra and Emery for putting together an incredible program for this conference and also an amazing venue. Um, I, I think you can appreciate the, the beauty of the area and the opportunity here we have to socialize. I think people don't give enough credit to the social aspects of these kind of technical conferences. And I think one of the great things about bringing people together is giving everyone a chance to think about you know, where we are now in the technology and where we're going. <clears throat> I also want to thank Emery and Chandra for giving me a chance to speak in front of this crowd. Um, it's an amazing opportunity for me. I feel very privileged to have your time and to, and to share some of my thoughts with you. I hope at the end of this talk, I hope you walk away with at least some knowledge that you didn't have before, and maybe a little, a little bit of a provocative aspect. I, I want you to walk away you know, ready to argue with me as I walk out the door. I think that's an important part of the talk as well. So today I'm going to talk about technical disruption. And I think it's important to understand that we live in a time of amazing technical disruption. Um, think about all the technology that we're facing. And, and what I'm going to talk about today is how our community and our and the efforts, the technical efforts that we do, are an essential part of those technical disruptions. Before I start, I want to talk about, of course, I want to talk about um, So I'm going to talk today about things that are not necessarily related to programming language. Specifically, I'm going to talk about well-being and health, public health. And this is a, this is a, a photo uh, from an article about the Zika virus. The Zika virus is affecting all of us, and it's affecting the world. I'm going to talk about stability, and I'm going to say things about financial stability in particular, and talk about how the work we do every day in our community affects the stability of the financial, uh, the financial system across the world. And finally, I'm going to talk about trust and security. And this, I use this as an example of the issues around trust because you know, no one would have thought that Volkswagen would cheat in their software and, and, and you know, fool the world and take the risk, the, the, the risk to their reputation that they did, and yet they did. And that's important to think about from a point of view of programming languages. So before I start, though, I want to say uh, that I'm a, a co-manager of the RISE group in uh, Microsoft Research in Redmond, the Research and Software Engineering Group. I co manage a group with Tom Ball. And it's a group of 30 researchers and, and developers that work together in many different areas of programming language. And I'm sure that you know many of the people on the slide. Um, they're, you know, they're very prominent members of the community. And I have to say, it's a great honor for me to work every day with these people and to talk to them and to hear about the projects they're working on and to think about the problems they're trying to solve. Um, I think that one of the things about this talk I want to mention is that much of what I talk about is informed by the, the conversations and the research that I've done with the people in this so I, wanted, I would just want to say I greatly appreciate being uh, having the opportunity to work with them. <clears throat> so, okay, so let's talk about disruption. Um, you know, you, you, you just look at the news, and you can tell from the news you know, what's going on in computer science. You know? So what do you think? Big data, deep learning. That's where it's all at. How many times have you heard about some new thing that you can do with deep learning? Or, you know, all the data that they're getting, and they're going to be able to predict this and that. Okay, this is what's going on. And the question is, like, well, where are we in this big picture? Right? Where is programming language? Do you hear much about big programming language? I don't. You don't hear too much. Um, yeah, and, and but, it, but it's important because these things are part of disruption. There's no doubt about that. Um, and so, you know, I, to, instead of trying to beat beat them, I'm going to join them. So I'm going to I'm going to preview to you something. It's an amazing result. You know, you'll you'll walk away astonished. Okay. Um, but 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 believe me, you know, I was too when I did this. Okay. So let's talk about 
we feel the act. Okay? <laughs> so, what does we feel the act? Huh? So, it's, it's, it, I'm going to show you. It's the first paper ever written by a neural net. In this case, it's a, it's a recurrent neural net, an RNN. Um, I say things about it. I went and collected seven years of, uh, of PDF files from uh, PLDI for the last seven years. Um, I, I took out the text. I worked with my son, Bill, uh, who happens to know a lot about it, uh, neural nets, and he, you know, he, uh, he helped me greatly with it. And basically, he put together a, a version of a, an RNN based on Torch, which is a, an infrastructure that's there, ran on a GPU, um, three layer LCM, if you care about the details, 40,000 training batches to train the, the neural net. Um, and there's this great article that Richard Sink told me about, uh, which actually is very, very related to this, uh, which is the unreasonable effectiveness of recurrent neural net. So, so one of the things that's shocking about this is how, with almost no effort, literally, I mean, of course, it's my son's effort, so whatever. <laughs> but with almost no effort, you can, you can take a bunch of data and you can produce this. Okay, so this is an excerpt from it. Um, and you can, you can try to read it. Um, you know, and I think one thing to point out, this is not edited. I did not take you know, something and start changing around and getting rid of the words in here. You can see I made some mistakes. Like I talked about, you know, era, era diddy, whatever that is. I um, sort of made up that word. Um, but I, I love the sentence. We present a convenient alias analysis that attains a number of queries in a type desk style. Now, in what community would you see that sentence? You would see that sentence in a PLDI paper, right? I would write that sentence, right? But, but in fact, I didn't write that, it was just, it just created. So where did that come from? And I think one of the things I want to, I want to point out here is that these things, you know, that, that are not part of our community, but we should think a lot about them, they produce stuff that looks a lot like a human did, right? It, you know, this is the weird thing. This is not a human writing this, but it looks like it was, and it could fool me. There's a notion of an uncanny valley here. It's like somehow computers can do things that look human. Right? And that's, that's a bit scary. There's, there's things that we have to think about when we, when we see this, and I'm going to talk about them in my talk. Okay, so uh, let's go back to disruption. I'll just talk about the people. So I want to make the case languages have always been part of disruption. Okay, languages have been around for a long time, and they've been central to changes in the way we think about technology, the way we run the world. For example, visual physicality back in 1979. It, it totally changed the way people did finance. In fact, if you think about it, it opened up this ability to do projection about fu the future. We can do this model, that model, that model. We can start choosing which is going to be most, the most effective. Visual Basic opened up the PC as a platform to many, many millions of developers to start building software that had Windows, etc. Um, Java, of course, Java, we all know Java, about the same time. Opened up the internet. It, it changed our thinking about what programs they They didn't run on a computer, they ran on a virtual machine. And all of a sudden, they could run anywhere. And finally, JavaScript. Uh, I love this uh, the book cover. Uh, it's the beta edition of a, of, a, of a book. You know, it's the first time I've ever seen a beta book. Uh, but the high level thing with JavaScript opened up the Web 2.0 model. And now every time we go to a browser page, we're not looking at a, a data, we're running a program. And that's a change. That's a huge disruptive change. And it's changed all the things. Everything we think about in terms of you know, uh, startups and social media, et cetera, based on this change. So we are there. We're in the middle of all of this. Okay? But in fact, you know, computing is really the middle of everything. This is part of the reason that we have this reach, right? And this is great, a great graph from Ed Lozowska. Ed Lozowska, it has an a really, a really amazing knack to be able to explain what's going on in computing times to a broad audience. And uh, this particular graphic talks about the expanding world of computing. So in particular, you know, programming languages, we don't even get our name on this picture, by the way, right? We're in this core CFC thing. So there's operating systems, databases, programming languages, architecture, they're all in the middle there. But that's not where the action is. If you think about what you read in the news today, it's about machine learning, it's about cloud computing. These are things that build on the core, but and they add to the core, but they're not the core, okay? But you know, his point, and this is a, you know, an important takeaway for this talk, is you know, it's much more than just these things around the core, it's actually verticals that affect humans, right? So energy, we worry about energy. Health, health is super important. Right? And all these technologies now are being used directly to make those things better. And I think you know, that's one of my challenges to you as an audience is you know, think about when you write a paper, when you do research, how does that affect important human problems? Okay, so I'm going to try to convince you, you know, you can disagree with me or not, but I'm going to try to convince you with three examples of where this technology intersects with, uh, okay, where this uh, technology intersects with um, you know, major societal problems, and uh, I hope I hope that you find some knowledge in this. Um, I'm hoping that you walk away with at least one new piece of information, and I'll tell you when it happens. 
<laughs> um, okay, let's talk about public health. This is a picture of the active areas where Zika is currently found. This is a relatively recent uh, image. And you know, Zika is an incredibly important uh, uh, you know, uh, development. And it's not the first, and it's not the last. And to be honest, there is, uh, the, the number of such outbreaks of infectious disease are increasing. So this is something we have to think about. You know, could be due to global warming? We don't know the cause, but it's a reality, and we have to live with this reality. It's a, it's a reality that affects every human on the earth. So let me take a detour here. Um, now let's go back to big, big data and uh, machine learning a little bit, because I saw this article in Wired. Have you, have you seen it at the end of code? OK, so let me tell you a little bit about what it basically says. Programmers are not going to need to program anymore. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to be training neural nets. So we're going to be basically teaching computers how to do the things we want them to do. We don't need to write any code anymore. And isn't that awesome? At the end of code, I mean, that's an amazing development, right? Um, so anyway, so I, I thought about this. And I thought, you know, wow. Um, you know, I know some wise people in the past who thought in these terms. And I tried to find some resource that would help me explain how I feel about this particular method. Um, and so I, I found Galileo, Gale, uh, who had insight in the third letter on the sunspots. Um, uh, if you don't read Italian, um, <laughs> this, this might be another way to read it. In the sciences, the authority of thousands of opinions is not worth as much as one tiny spark of reason. So, you know, it's, he made an amazing development, which was, it doesn't matter what you think. It's what the facts are, and we need to go and find the facts. Okay, so let me, let me give you a slightly more modern translation. In the sciences, the authority of deep learning output it's not worth as much as one result from an S&P <laughs> okay? And you know, and think about that. <laughs> think about that. That that is a true statement. I mean, you can look at the RNN, you can look at DPLD and say, "Wow, that looks real. That looks like a human did that." But what does it mean? It's meaningless. It's semantically meaningless. Okay. So let's move on. What I want to really make the point here is that we should honor the amazing developments that have happened in the field of automated reasoning in our field over the last 30 years. In fact, it's not just me. I mean, these have been honored. You know, Koch won the ACM System Software Award recently. The Board of Earth Theory Planner won it before. Uh, Z3 run, or, or recently won the Sync Planner Award. The, 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 these are amazing achievements, and they don't get a lot of press. You don't hear a lot about Z3 in the public, in the public space. But in fact, in a lot of ways, they've advanced the human, uh, the state of human knowledge significantly over uh, the, the prior art. And I think we should, we should be all proud of this. And we should think also about what, what is the impact of this in the future? What's the trend here? So I'll just say a little bit about Z3. Um, I'm sure you know, mostly know about it, but I'll, I'll just say some, some things to illustrate what, you know, what goes on. You know, I think it, just like all these tools, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tool that it provides a layer that hides a lot of complexity from a person who needs to use it. In particular, people have figured out you can, you can frame many problems as SAP problems, or in this case, uh, Satisfiability on a different theory. So, in particular, on a theory of, uh, of numbers, you can you, know, you can basically talk about nonlinear relations like x squared plus y squared plus one, x, x times y greater than point one. And the SAT solvers, you don't have to know how they work. You just give them that that set of constraints, and they either come back with a result, yes, here's one particular example, or no, this is totally this this can never be true, and here's why. And we've seen this, so this is a very basic idea, and it's so it's simple to explain. Even a kid can use a set solver. That's the great thing about it. You can explain to them you know, what it does. But then you can take that to scale, and you can solve amazing problems. So in particular, you can start saying, well, how do I get down this certain path? Is it feasible to go to this point in my program based on some input? And you know, it doesn't matter how long that path is. That can be a really long path, and the set solvers can still give you the answer. Okay? I just heard this yesterday that it's not just, so we use, we use a, a technology called Sage in Microsoft to find bugs, and it's found many, many bugs, security critical bugs in Windows and Office. And it uses this technique. Now, the thing that's scary about this, I heard that uh, just yesterday, I heard that uh, there are, in fact, uh, hackers that are using this now to find security vulnerabilities. And so, you know, this is a double edged sword, right? But it's a powerful tool, right? And, and this is why our technology, our field, our community has been doing amazing things. Uh, you can do the same thing. You can say, is this assertion ever violated? What, under what context, what set of conditions will this assertion be violated? Okay. Yeah, so anyway, so I'm sure you've heard about Z3. If you haven't, you know, it's amazing technology. Um, it's open source. You can go and check it out. Um, I definitely encourage you to. 
Yeah, but you know, if we talk about how, how good, say, Siri is to understand natural language, um, you know, but the reality is these stat solvers are already superhuman, right? They can deal with, they can do a system of constraints that are unimaginable. In fact, the people back in the 80s, I talked to Moshe Barty, you know, in the 80s they had no clue that you'd be able to scale to the size of the inputs of these, uh, these uh, automatic fear improvers. And, and the reason was because they're exponential complexity. And yet you can give, you can give a, a two megabyte file to Z3. And this, this is the paper he used uh, in proof of verified TLS implementation. I got it from Nikhil Swami. You can give that, and it can give you back an answer relatively quickly, right? So, you know, so are, is that amazing? I mean, that's amazing. It's an amazing world that we live in. Okay, so you're probably saying, what the heck? You know, this is, this, you're talking about Z3, you're talking about the theory for What does that got to do with public health? You know, this is, this is just a, a ruse. Um, so, okay, so let me talk about Ethan Jackson. Okay, this is Ethan Jackson. Um, He's in the RISE group. Uh, it was a formal method. He invented formula programming language, which is part of Key, which you know, has been used in a number of instances. It's a language for the programming asynchronous system. Here's the even holding a drone in the jungle. What's all that about? Okay. And what does that have to do with Zika? Okay. So let me tell you a story. It's a story about Ethan, who had an ama amazing imagination, and he, he, he foreshadowed a, a, an important result. Oh, what is it? Is my sound okay? Okay, he started with a question. He asked himself, what if you can use mosquitoes as a sensor to detect infectious disease around the globe? Right? What would that do? It would give you the equivalent of weather forecasting for infectious disease. And that's really important. You know, it'd be very nice to know where Ebola is in the, in the environment. You could go and get rid of it. You could avoid it coming into a human population. So, so that's a great question. It's like a lot of the really important things that people do in the world involve a really simple question that, you know, in, in theory, it's like, how do you do this? And, and why would a formal methods guy think it's possible? Um, but but it, that, that question started down a path that Ethan's followed, and it's, it's an amazing path. So he started working with biologists, field biologists, and he started working with um, uh, insect in, uh, people, uh, expertise in insects and uh, infectious disease. And he, he realized that the way they catch mosquitoes Historically, has been a thing like this, and you can see it. Um, let's see here. Okay. Anyway, you can see it's got a CO2 trap, which basically is a way to attract the mosquitoes to come there, and then it's got a big fan and a net. So you know, anything that flies near that thing gets sucked into it, and then you know, six hours later, eight hours later, whatever, when, the, when all the CO2 is gone, the fans run out of battery. Somebody comes out to this thing. It's heavy, and they get they get the mosquitoes, and they have to sort them out, and they get rid of the bugs they don't care about, and then they have a little tiny pile of mosquitoes. Okay. So that's that's the uh, infectious disease. You know, that's a mosquito trap circa 2015, and this is a premonition trap. This is something that even and, and the researchers at Microsoft Research have developed, um, and it, it's a it's it's a disruptive replacement for the previous technology. It's it's a it's it's a significant improvement. Okay, so in this case. It's got a lot of little cells. Each one of those cells is designed to catch a single mosquito. And it's got, it's got smarts. It's a smart trap. So when a mosquito flies into the cell, it actually listens to the frequency of the wing beat, and it decides whether or not it's the right mosquito. So it can catch a mosquito of a specific species. Okay? Uh, it's very lightweight. Uh, it's got a 12-hour endurance. You know, it, it, it uses electronics. But it's also reusable. So you know, so what happens is the field biologist goes and gets, gets the trap, empties it out, sets it up again, puts it back out, ready to go. Um, so this is an Internet of Things device. I'm going to talk more about those. It's a smart mosquito trap. Um, okay, and but how does this feel? How does it, how does this tell a story of infectious biology? Well, so this is the premonition project which each of has initiated. And it starts with drones. Drones go out into the environment. It's very hard in these jungles to figure out what's going on. It's very hard for humans to get them. Many are it finds likely places where mosquitoes might live, and it basically deploys these traps. You know, five pounds, pretty easy to carry in a drone. Once the mosquito traps are in place, <coughs> they catch mosquitoes, they can be, they can be recovered. <coughs> um, we get DNA samples from the mosquitoes. You feed those DNA samples to the cloud to understand what the mosquito is what's munching on, essentially. So either the mosquito itself is infected, or the things that it bit were infected. And from the DNA from those things, you can actually figure out what's going on. And you can do this in a cycle that's much faster, even than you know, what it takes for a scientist to go out to a field site, you know, set up a trap, and then bring it back to get one sample. You can do this at scale, and that's what they're doing. You know, but what does that start doing with formal methods? 
Um, the, the thing to think about in this system is that every one of the components involves software, and at, the, at, at some level, making that software work correctly is an important task that we don't know how to do. So in particular, the drone here, the drone is like an aircraft, and it has a lot of software in it, but you, know, you don't want that drone to, run, to fly into something. You don't want it to crash. So you want it to, to execute in a way that you actually know that it's going to do the mission that you give it. And you're giving it a complex mission. In this case, you may be using machine learning just to figure out where to go, for example. So the, the Safe Cyber Physical Systems Project expedition at Microsoft Research, which was sponsored by Jeanette Wynn, uh, looks at this problem of deploying uh, devices and, and technology like drones uh, and and breaks it down into compartments that you can then attack with formal methods. So you can build a secure OS. You can make a robust sensing infrastructure. You can build a correct control of feedback system. And finally, even the, even the AI planning could be, could be reasoned about systematically and made to be you know, correct by some definition of correct. So what I want to leave you with is this notion that you know, we start with automated reasoning, but automated reasoning applied to problems at scale is a transformative technology. It changes the way we do science. It changes the way we think about solving problems. It, it takes us way beyond what an individual human can do. And we've started by looking and saying, look, here's a million lines of code. What can we do with a million lines of code? But we, we end in a place where we, we've transformed science and we've transformed society. And that's a great story. So anyway, the future looks awesome. You know? I could just end the talk right here, and we'd be all done. Right? And we'd pat ourselves on the back. It's like. You know, it's a good, it's a great thing. This is a, this is something we should celebrate. Um, but let me talk about it. Um, okay, so let's talk about financial stability. This is another important problem. Um, in fact, you know, arguably, uh, you know, we you know, we feel we're still feeling the effects of, of the of the recession, the, you know, the great recession back in 2007, 2008. Um, and you know, in the end, what, what is it all about? Well, financial stability is based on all the projections. There's so much speculation going on. In the markets, it's all about projecting where we are and where we're going to be and making decisions. So how do you make those decisions based on data? It starts with spreadsheets. I'll talk about that. But let me take a step back a little bit because I have a beef to pick with your class here. Um, you know, here's his book, Algorithms Plus Data Structures Equals Programs. Okay? And you know, it, the problem is that I think that our community is very, is very code-centric. You know, a long time ago, you know, von Neumann basically said, look, we've got the data, and we've got the, the code, and, you know, they go back and forth, you know, but, and we think, okay, let's make that code correct. But we, we think very little about the data, to be honest. I, you know, I think uh, here's the problem, is that every program, every computation you do include, it involves data, and if that data is not correct, then your, your code is useless, right? You know, and you say, oh, wait a minute, we've got that covered, right? We check, we check the inputs, right? Check the inputs, make sure that there's no bad data. Um, and this is, a, this is a classic binary decision, right? Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, sure, that program is worthless if the, if the input is bad, but you know, that's not the, you know, that, 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 you need shades of gray here, right? You know, a lot of data is good, right? So how do you deal with that? Um, and, and so I would argue, I just a challenge to the automated reason community, think about the data, don't just think about the code. Give me some reason about the data. And you know, of course there's work in proxy computing, et cetera, where this is happening, but re the reality is that it's a much harder problem and it's still very important. You know, and we'll see. You know, we'll see why. You know, to make this concrete, um, if, you, if you've seen the movie or read the book, Michael Lewis has a, a, an amazing take on the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, um, about basically the, the you know the, the speculation about the mortgage market was was totally wrong. Right? It was based on bad data. And the, the story here is that a couple guys said, "Look, you know, I'm going to look at the data. I'm not going to." Assume it's good data. I'm going to look at it, and they figure out it was just it, just, it was they were making the wrong decision, okay? And then, you know, so it, you know, the hundreds of billions of dollars lost, you know, you know, people out of work even now. I mean, this is an amazing problem, and it's all about bad data. <clears throat> so let me say a little bit about code and data. You know, going back to going, I think you know we do this weird thing of separating the code and the data, and it's you know it's just part of the style of doing things. In this case, I gave you a regular expression. And I'm going to ask you, what does that do? Right? Can you figure out what that does? You know, of course it looks like line noise. And you know, I made it way easy, so you probably, most of you probably already figured out, yeah, I kind of get it. Um, but here's the point. It's like, it parses an email address, you know, it tells you if it's a correct, well-formed email address. Right? 
But you know, you would not you would not know that. If I took away all those uh, domain names, you probably would definitely not know that. Okay. Um, so so you know you can see there's a there's a fundamental problem here about the separation. You need, to understand the code, often you need the data right there. And I would, here, here's just a plug for um, some great technology that Simic Alani and others at Microsoft Research created, including Richard Singh. Um, there's a programming by example technology that's in PowerShell right now, so you can go and use this today. You can download it. PowerShell is a, a shell programming language that's in Windows. And uh, this is an example of this thing called commandlets, and there's a commandlet called convert from string. And essentially what it does is it uses programming by example to build uh, data extractors. So in this particular case, what I've shown is uh, if I had a file full of email addresses, I could give this program by example technology an example of what I want. In this case, I want to extract one field, which is the, the email, the name of the email, uh, uh, and then another field, which is a domain, and I want to create an output that's, that's just a list of those two columns. So instead of writing that nasty regular expression and extracting out the fields, I just give you this. So I'm, I'm combining code and data. This is interesting because it's, it's implicit code, right? It's not really code that says do this and do that. It's actually, this is, this is an example of what I want. Figure out what it, you know, what it means. And this is an interesting space because now you talk about code and data inter integrated, what you have then is a problem of trying to figure out what it means to actually extract a particular thing. Even a well-written program might have bugs, might not work for all. But I was going to talk about spreadsheets, and so let me say a few things about that. <clears throat> so I have a lot to work in the last few years on spreadsheet technology. This is an example from a paper uh, that Dan Barrowy uh, and I did last year at PLDI. And it shows um, historical trends in forest, uh, forest harvest in different countries. Um, people use spreadsheets for amazing way, in amazing ways, very creative. The nice thing about that, they're very unconstrained. In this particular case, um, you know, the, the author of the spreadsheet uh, put in zero value pairs, and so you can easily see for, say, Aust Austria, you know, what happens over the course of the years. Um, but the highlight takeaway is that spreadsheets are an important way for people to think about data and think about computation and embed them together in the same place. Now, I'm not going to talk about the, the, the work, the flashlight work. I'm going to talk more about the problems of spreadsheets, and in particular, Spreadsheets are often used to, to reason about money, okay? So here's an example from the year 2000 where uh, the, the, uh, the United Kingdom HM uh, Customs and Excise uh, Organization looked at uh, seven files that involved spreadsheet re uh, reporting of taxes uh, uh, for the UK government. And um, there were uh, large, large files, uh, 21 worksheets, uh, 700 formulas, uh, accounting for about 12 million dollars, 12 million pounds and in their, in their analysis, they basically found that those, the, those spreadsheets systematically underreported the taxes to the tune of about 11 percent. So, you know, 1.4 million pounds in just these seven spreadsheets. You know, and, and so they had to, you know, they were, and there, there's a lot of guidance about what you do to look at these spreadsheets and how you figure out if they have issues. But the fact is, they have a lot of problems. Okay, and I'll show you why. But let's talk about a bigger problem. Okay, so. I don't know if you've heard of the London Whale. Um, this is a great story. I love the story. So there was this trader in J.P. Morgan in London, and he loved to make huge trades. I mean, huge trades. That's why they call him the Whale. And so in 2012, he decided to make a, a giant trade, and it was a terrible decision, and he lost a ton of money. People figured out you know, that he just made a huge mistake. And so they bet against him, and basically, I think you know, J.P. Morgan lost him. The, the, the trades itself were about $5 billion. J.P. Morgan ended up paying $920 $120 million just in a, you know, a settlement, loss, a lawsuit settlement. I mean, that's a lot of money. Okay, so why did he make this mistake? Okay. Well, it was a spreadsheet. Okay. It was a single cell in a spreadsheet, and it was a simple calculation. Instead of doing, let's see, instead of dividing by a sum, I don't know, instead of dividing by average, he divided by the sum, which made the value smaller, and as a result, he thought the risk was much lower than it. So he's thinking, this is a great deal. I, this is a super low risk thing. I'm going to make that deal. I'm going to make that trade. And he was just wrong. It was, a, it was a high volatility trade, and he missed it. So one mistake in one cell, okay? And, and, and so why didn't he have some help with that? You know, six billion dollars made me want to have some help. Um, I think you know people out here probably could help. Um, okay, but it happens in other areas. So this is the Reinhard Rogoff. Uh, Reinhard Rogoff uh, were an economist who used data, historical data from 
uh, different countries about their economic growth, and they looked at the debt load of the country, and they decided whether or not having too much debt would cause you to not grow. Okay, so this, this idea, the result of their, their work, uh, promoted this notion of austerity, that if the country's too far in debt, we have to really cut back on spending, because otherwise, we're going to lose, you know, the economy's going to fail. Um, now, it turns out, you know, researchers in Massachusetts uh, identified, look, they finally got the Reinhardt Workup spreadsheet to look at, the big spreadsheet, has a lot of data, and they, they examined it carefully, and they found bugs. There are bugs in the spreadsheet, and if you, if you look carefully, you realize that the, the conclusion of austerity is actually the wrong conclusion based on the data. So they, they reached an important economic policy decision based on bad data. And let me show you what that looks like. Okay. So this is the, the summary sheet for the right hand right hand spreadsheet. And you know, the, the, the colors are not mine. Uh, I apologize, it's kind of small, it's a little hard to see. But you can see, you know, it sort of talks about the country. It's very measured down at the bottom of the, 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 the calculations on the, the overall. Now this is the thing I want you to walk away with and remember from now on. Okay, this is the one thing from the talk. Okay, and that's the formula view of Excel. Okay, most people don't know about this. If you hit Control Back Quote in Excel, it gives you a different view. So let me let me do that again here. Good trick. Okay, you start with this. Oh, it's a bunch of data, a bunch of numbers. Okay, but no, there's a lot of formulas in this in the spreadsheet, and it's hard to see. And you don't 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 pay attention to say equal users. That's what you want to see is at the bottom, the bottom row, there's a bunch of sums and averages and maxes. Okay? And you know, if you don't know about this, it's the first thing that you should do every time you open the spreadsheet is look at where the formulas are because you'd be surprised. You're gonna find some surprises in there. Um, okay, but you can't see this, it's hard to see, so I'll make it more clear. You see the cell down there, that's an average of this column, and I've highlighted the values that are contributing to the average. Okay, so you're thinking, okay. That's odd. Um, usually when you average a column, you want all the values in the column. Right? So what happened to those values? It turns out, it turns out that the countries of Denmark, Canada, Belgium, Austria, and Australia did not matter in their calculations. For some reason they decided that these should not be included in the, in the, in the sum, in the average. So you know, here's the takeaway is that you know this is you can see with this view, with this view, you would not know that there's a problem, right? You think, okay, they did a good calculation. With this view, if you look carefully, you start realizing, huh, that's odd. You know, and so here's my question to the community. Why is it that I can give you a million line program and you can point to bugs in it, right? Automatically. And yet you can't tell Reinhard Robot that they've got a problem with the spreadsheet. So they shouldn't make their conclusions about economic policy. Okay. Just, just a thought. Okay, let me just go on. I mean the problem is spreadsheet should be deceptive. So in this case, you see the row that's in gray. It looks like all the other rows. You think it's probably think it's calculated the same way, uh, but in fact, again, you look at the formula view for that row, and you notice something odd, right? That all the other rows are calculated uh, with values that are related to other values in the row, but in this row, they're all just values, right? So somebody replaced a formula with a value, and looking at it this way, I have no clue, right? This is the perfect opportunity, either for you know, mistakes, which happen, or fraud, right? It's like I can just change the numbers a little bit. You have no clue unless you actually know about the formula. Okay, so, so you can send me your contributions afterwards. It's a brilliant insight about Excel. Um, okay. okay, so uh, you know, I don't want to go on about this too much. Um, I just want to say, um, you know, there have been advances. I think it's important work, advances in spreadsheet correctness. Uh, Glenn and Hermann uh, has been publishing a set of ideas around this, what they call spreadsheet smells. I'm not particularly fond of the, the term. Um, uh, <laughs> It's, you know, Emory has been doing great work on understanding the data values of spreadsheets, and that was in the Excel published newsletter. And more recently, just in XA 2016, a group from Hong Kong who looked at actually um, uh, clustering uh, spreadsheet cells and trying to reason about uh, uh, the properties, uh, statistical black properties of clusters. Um, uh, other advances, just to say, I mean, there's been a lot of important work. You know, spreadsheets are valuable both as a tool to get things done, and also you want to make sure they're correct. And there's been great advances as well in the, in the correct in the uh, productivity side, including Flash Shell, uh, which is done by Simon Galani. Um, there's work on table extraction that I mentioned with uh, Dan Barry. Uh, and also, uh, I want to mention a recent work by Richard Singh called Blinkfill, which is uh, you know a sort of next generation version of Flash Fill, which I encourage you to look at to be able to do this. Okay, so 
Okay, so, uh, you know, I'm done with spreadsheets, uh, but I don't want you to think that that's the end of the story with respect to programming. Okay, so let's talk about correctness in, in si financial systems that are more complex than spreadsheets, okay? And, you know, so the fact is we can't even get spreadsheets right. So that's, that's a good starting point. But we can do much more. So let's look at what's going on. Um, people are using social media to predict the markets, right? So you look at, you know, what, who's being mentioned in Twitter? What is the sentiment analysis? Are people happy today? You know, is it a good day? Should, should I buy? Should I sell? Okay. They're also using Google. You, know, uh, you start looking at Google Trends and say, if I just had all that data Google has, I can, I can tell the future. I can use that data. And this is a scary one for me. A deep learning trading firm is already profitable, right? People are using deep learning to decide what to buy and sell. Okay. And they'll sell you that. They'll sell you that capability. It's like you give me hundred thousand dollars, and I'll make great use of it. So here's my question to you: Is you know how many? Of, if we look at the whole system of financial markets, how many decisions today are based on software that people don't understand? You know that does things like uh, neural nets that people have no clue what they do at some level, you know, or have bugs in them. Even if you know exactly what you're doing, is your code robust in the sense that we, we talk about in this field? And my guess is not. So I think one of the challenges for the community is to think about these problems and bring our technology to them and make the financial markets. So I'll just leave this section of the talk with a high level message, which is, you know, think about code and data together. You know, things that employ the two side by side have been extremely powerful. So in particular, spreadsheets, incredible story, but also if you think about Java plus HTML, JavaScript plus HTML. I mean, that's a great embedding of a, a program into a piece of data where they coexist and they know about each other. So, you know, I, I just want to leave you with the fact that, you know, these tools are still very weak. There's a lot of speculation going on based on that, based on these uh, computation analyses, and, and the state of the art of correctness in these, in these tools is very weak. In fact, if you look at R, if you've had a chance to look at R, you realize it's so easy to make mistakes in R, and yet uh, it's you know there are no great tools for it. Okay, okay, so I'm going to uh, conclude my talk with you know sort of one of my uh, uh, I'm going to think of it as uh, an area that I've think about a lot recently, and also a, a something that is near and dear to my so we go back to the expanding world of computing from Ed Lazowska. And you know, I think you know, Ed was right in saying you know, computers are, are sort of the computing technology is flowing into all these different verticals and it's having more and more impact. You know, and one of the conclusions you draw when you when you make this uh, connection is that every company now is not just a company that does X, it's a it's a company that does software plus X. So in particular, you know, if I'm selling a toaster, right? I'm selling a toaster. I'm good at making toasters. I know about you know the, the switches and the, the heat, and you know I can make it cheaply. But nowadays, it's like if I want to sell you a toaster, I have to sell you a smart toaster because that gives you this advantage, right? It gives you a market advantage, and that's what people want. So now I can talk to my toaster. I can say, "Hey, toaster, make me some toast," and it will come back. It will say, "Yes, absolutely." It'll, it'll chat with you. Toasters can do this, okay? It's fine. So every company is software company. What does that mean exactly? Well, it means that companies are hiring up computer scientists like crazy. But look at the auto industry. Right? Auto industry, there's a huge rush right now to be the company that, that understands self-driving cars. Okay? If you're not that company, you're yesterday's history. You, I mean, this is disruption happening right now. Okay? And what does that mean? It means that they're hiring people like crazy. They're building software like crazy. Think about Tesla. Tesla, is it a car company? Tesla is a battery company and a software company, okay? It's not a car company, okay? You know, obviously, they build a car, but that's totally peripheral to their value proposition. And I would argue, you know, Tesla's got great engineers. I, I have total respect for their engineering, but every car company has to come up with that same level of engineering and the same quality of software, right? That's a hard problem. That's a problem that we need to think about because we're driving these cars, right? Okay, here's another one. Um, GE has a social media agenda. I have no clue what that means. <laughs> but, but I will say this, GE is not a software company that you think of. You know, it's, a, it's a jet engine company, it builds things. Um, but in fact, uh, one of the stories about GE is that data from its, its jet engines flows back to GE. It's all about, it's got a big data story, it's been there for many years. Um, and then there's another scary one. Monsanto is the big data to take over the world. Again, Monsanto is in agribusiness. It knows about growing things, it knows about plants and biology. But now it knows about, it has to know about data. And why, why is that? Well, one of the things that they do, you know, you 
can imagine is if you know enough about who's growing what and how, you know, how it's doing, like, is it growing well today? They can ask that question, right, if they have this data. They can start think, thinking about the markets and say, hey, you know, six months from now, we know that the harvest is going to be horrible, right? So we're going to, you know, speculate, and this is how they make money. Now, that's not helping people grow it. That's basically, you know, using this predictive ability and, and a knowledge advantage to basically put them in a, in a position where they have a you know, market advantage. <clears throat> okay, so another obvious conclusion, every object is a computer. So here is a set of objects. Um, you know, I, 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 can you guess what the other object is? Tesla is one. Uh, the top middle, what is that? Anybody know? Amazon Echo. How many people have an Echo? Okay, so here you go. So you've got this thing you talk to in your does it talk back yet? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, okay. Um, that's my club band. Max, how about this one down at the middle one of the body? Anyone guess? That's a doorbell. Okay. It's a smart doorbell. It's a company called Ring.com. Okay. So, you know, I was telling people about you know, IoT and smart things or whatever, and, um, and I, I just deserved it. Oh, one of these days I'll have a smart port. Right? Yep. <laughs> they already do. You. Okay, so this is a concern. I personally am concerned about this. Why is that? It's because you think about it, it's like I'm used to think about okay, I've installed patches on my computer, you know, I run my antivirus, I worry about it getting hacked. Okay, oh now the nest, well what about you know how often is the nest updated? Who's updating it? I don't have to deal with that. Okay, here's what I don't want. I don't want to have to worry if my if my fork is stealing my password. Okay? Right? I don't want to have to worry if my fork is telling somebody that I'm not home, right? But I have to now. If I buy that thing, if I buy my Fitbit, if I, whatever, I have to worry about these things. Everything, I have to worry about everything. I have trust issues, okay? So this is the world we're creating. So think about that. We, we're creating, we've enabled it, we build the technology that allows you to build it. So, you know, let me just expand a little bit. So think about it. How much today does your life depend on correct software? Like, when I fly in an airplane, it depends entirely on the software, okay? And I'm happy because they have a very rigorous process to make sure that software does only what it's supposed to and nothing else, okay? Uh, but, you know, that's it. That's it for the regulation. Everything else is unregulated. Um, so, you know, so what about those cars? You know, what is the rigor involved in, in certifying whether Tesla self-driving ability is correct? Um, what's the trend? Okay, so today maybe it's a certain way. What about tomorrow? What about, you know, six months from now, a year from now? It's going to change. I would argue with the you know, IoT, et cetera, it's going to be increasingly we're going to depend on these things, right? And, you know, and the other side of it is, okay, well, the government is there. They do regulation. They have policies in place to protect people's public safety, public health, et cetera. So are they in a position to understand the trends and to do something about it? Do we trust that it's not up to us. Because either it's us or it's the government. I mean, there's nobody else, right? There's nobody that's going to come in and say, no, we're not going to do software this way. We're going to do it a different way. Um, so anyway, so the question I have for you is, when do you start worrying about this? Is it today? Is it next year? Is it is this something that's 50 years out? See, my, what's it? It's today. Yesterday. <laughs> Yesterday. There you go. No, the point here is, it's like, I, I, want, I want you to walk away believing that this is not a problem of the future. This is a problem of a, a today and the only way we're going to do something about it is to do it soon. It's not about waiting. It's not about saying, okay, well, you know, as, long, as soon as I get tenure, then I'll worry about it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so let me be very specific because, again, you know, it's in the news, right? It's not, I'm not making this stuff up. Uh, how many people have heard of the ransomware epidemic? Okay, okay, so right, so it's out there in the news, okay? These ransomware, these hackers are targeting people and businesses. In particular, the most recent trend has been hospitals. You know, and locking down the data and making it so that you can't do stuff. And, and it's ransom. You can't do so. You can't run your hospital unless they give you the key. And it works. They actually, people pay the ransom. It's a, it's a growing business. In fact, it's so effective, you know, the, the, these, these hackers have figured out ways to exploit all the software, but they haven't figured out how to monetize it until now, right? So now they have a way to directly monetize it. And Bitcoin was huge here, right? Because now it's like, it's not about, you know, making some kind of transaction to a bank that, you know, the government can go after. It's, yeah, they just make a Bitcoin transaction. And, and you know, who knows how easy this attraction is, right? Um, turns out it is pretty easy, but don't tell the bank. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, here's FireEye reporting the, the percentage of malware that was 
ransomware between the months of February, which is the 10% month, and the month of March, which is the 70% month. So one of the things you have to understand is that exploitation has become a business that works at scale. So now these exploit kits allow people to very quickly, when they see a new opportunity, a new business opportunity, move into that space and, and take advantage of it. Okay? And that's, that's not going to change, right? It's, you know, people learn the business and that's how they learn. Okay, so you know, just to make the case a little stronger, smart everything increases the attack surface. Um, in this particular case, I love this. This is uh, Jonathan Protenko pointing me to this blog post by Matthew Garrett. Uh, if you can't read it, it says, I bought an off the light bulb so you don't have to. And uh, uh, this guy, Matthew Garrett, uh, bought a few light bulb, a smart light bulb. And he's a security guy, so he started poking. You know, he started figuring out what, what makes it tick. And he found some kind of horrendous things about it. Okay? So in particular, uh, he found you could log into the light bulb as root with, with a trivial password. It was added. Okay, so, so anybody on the network can go to the light bulb and log in as root. Okay, that's the first thing. I, also, light bulb communicated with the app that controlled it in an open protocol, like a, like a non-encrypted protocol. So basically, he could watch the, the, the interaction. So he could inject his own packets to contribute. Um, you know, there's no encryption. He found it was easy to crash. So if you wanted to crash the light bulb, you could. In fact, uh, researchers at UW, um, uh, Yoshi Kono and others basically have started asking the question, can you, if you, if I can do things to this light bulb, can I make it grow, burn up? Can I basically start a fire in your house? Okay, fortunately, they didn't find any such bulbs, but, you know, but it's, it's scary to think that that's a question that, that attackers, you know, can have, you know, people that'll, that'll uh, give you ransomware are thinking about. It's like, you know, give me money or your house burns down. That's a scary thought, right? <clears throat> and, oh, and by the way, this is a great point. Um, you know, he had these problems, he called the company. It's like the company's, oh, we don't support that product anymore. So no updates, you know, we don't care about the fact that it has all these issues. And that's the problem. It's like, it goes, you know, there's a lot of things, internet or whatever, but the point is that we don't want the things that we buy, these smart things, to become junk or, or worse, you know, to be actually, you know, add no value into the Oh, uh, so it gets worse. Um, so this is the Did I mention companies cheat? Right? And I, I started with Volkswagen. I go back to it, right? You know, think about that. Think about Volkswagen. Think about people at that company saying to themselves, you know, we have a, an amazing uh, historical reputation building great cars, and, you know, and we, we love our customers, and we're going to cheat them. We're going to basically lie to them, every car we sell, and we think it's worth it. We're, they did this value calculation. It's like, this is what we make in profit. This is how much risk there is. It's like, ooh, you know, what, what are we going to do? Oh, we're going to cheat. So think about that, okay? Because that, that's a strange thing to think, you know, for a company to do. This is a big company, right? These are important, you know, important products. Okay, so let me explain my thinking about why this happened. Right? Um, so there's this uh, MIT Tech Review uh, came up with the fact that many cars have 100 million lines of code. Okay? That's as much as most, you know, most major software companies. 100 million lines of code, right? So, you know, so now you, you start you know, going back, it's like the value proposition of cheating. Well, it's like, how hard is it to cheat in 100 million lines of code if I only inject 10 lines of code? And by the way, nobody gets to look at my code, okay? Nobody gets to see. It's, you know, the only way I can actually look at what the code they wrote was is to have a lawsuit and have some kind of uh, probable cause to look at their code. So, so, you know, that's a pretty easy calculation for a lot of people to believe it may be worth it. It's worth the risk. Now, if it's worth the risk for Volkswagen, think about the company that made the Hue light bulb, right? They don't have a giant reputation. They've got no, they may have no profit at all, right? They've got nothing to lose, and it may be something to gain for cheating. So it's not just that people put bugs in software accidentally. It's actually the real risk that they put them there intentionally. <clears throat> okay. Wow. I have no idea. I I'm sorry, I started on a high note. <laughs> Kind of a bummer, right? You know, it's just this is a tough situation. But look, I'm I'm trying to tell the story here because you're the ones that will do something about it in the end. You are the one, okay? Um, and, and let me just try to make a case that we actually made the progress. Um, so let me start by talking about uh, Saku Uridi. Um, so I had the fortune in the last couple of years to work on the, the CCC, the Computer Computing Consortium, and the Computer Community Consortium, and as part of the CRA, and it was a great opportunity. So they, they advised the federal government on computer science trends, specifically around what the government should do with respect to funding and policy. Um, and 
and as a result, I got a chance to meet people in, in Washington, incredible people on the committee and across the community, uh, the computer science community. Um, and in particular, at that Sakuri, um, he's the AD CPS at NIST. Um, you know, when you're in Washington, you, you talk like that a lot. <laughs> okay. It stands for the Associate Director of Cyber Systems at NIST. Okay? Um, but he had this great question. So he's a mechanical engineer, but yet he's in charge of uh, this program around cyber physical systems. And uh, you know, we, we were talking about how engineers and software developers are quite different in the way they think about things. And his point was, you know, people need to start thinking different ways about what they build. Okay. So he asked me this question. He said, you know, Stuxnet. So Stuxnet, uh, if you remember, is uh, malware that was intended to disable Iranian centrifuges. It's a very specific target. Okay. And it worked. It actually disabled a bunch of centrifuges. And they, you know, they, the point was they, they believe it put back the Iranian nuclear program uh, for some number of years. Um, so he asked me, it's like, well, how do you prevent this? And of course, you know, I'm a computer scientist. I'm thinking, okay, you know, safe software, you know, uh, more, more uh, bounds checking, and, you know, up to date patches, et cetera, of course. Right? It's like, nope, nope, wrong. The answer is install a limit switch on the centrifuge. Think about that. That's the solution. No more Stuxnet, right? There's no point because you can't make them break themselves, right? And so the, the high level message here is mechanical engineers have a very different way of thinking about solving a problem. And in particular, failsafe is an important dimension. You know, they know, they know that you can't make the software perfect. So you have to have layers in there that prevent problems anyway. So one of the one of my challenges to the you know this this group is to think about what the layers are, right? I, I hear a lot, I went to uh, Dave Patterson's retirement party, and I heard a lot about breaking down barriers when you do big data. Like, I want to know about the car traffic, and I want to know about the, the local weather, and I want to know about the air quality, and I want to combine all the stuff, right? But when you combine it all, you break down these barriers, you know, maybe there's a problem. Maybe there's firewalls that need to be in place to prevent these kinds of systematic failures. Okay? So, I think adversarial thinking is important. We need computer scientists to think like more like mechanical engineers and how they build some fail-safe mechanisms. And we need mechanical engineers to think more like computer scientists in that they now have to think everything I build, every smart thing, is an attack surface. And it can be used against the individual who has it. So, you know, this is not just me. Uh, it's happening in the federal government. Um, so, uh, Obama announced in February a, of a program, a cybersecurity assurance program, uh, which you know is being promoted, and uh, what does that mean exactly? Well, the high-level model of the cybersecurity insurance program is like the underwriter's lab model, where they put you know for a particular product, if you meet a set of uh, standards, you, you're certified. You get a little label of approval, essentially. Okay, and in fact, uh, UL, uh, which has this great reputation, it's a well-known sort of source of authority, uh, has actually started promoted a cybersecurity insurance program, uh, which you can go to the website. And so they emphasize things like up-to-date patches, you know, testing methods, buzz testing, whatever, uh, some kind of program analysis, and you know, use of correct use of crypto. Right? A lot of the problems that we had in that smart light bulb might be fixed by this. So let me ask you a question. If you got a device, a smart port that had a cybersecurity assurance label on it, how how confident would you be that that fork was not going to steal your patch? You know, we, we know each other, right? You know, it's like, think about that. And yet, this is the program. This is what we're going to sell people. And, you know, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. I think it's a brilliant idea. Are, is anyone here actually involved in this program? Okay, let me have a show of hands. How many people have heard about it the first time today? Show, raise your hand. Okay. So what, what's the deal, right? So we're, we're the community that does this kind of stuff. And yet, it's happening without us. Okay? What, what's going on? Tell me. You know, okay, so anyway, bottom line, I'm not, as, I'm not that assured, and I hope that maybe more of the people in the room next, next year will raise their hands that they know about it and that they actually are contributing something. Okay, so let me say a couple things about what, what I know about that is happening. Okay? Um, in particular, there's a project that was funded out of, uh, by the NSF, uh, the Expeditions and Computing Project called DSPEC, um, and it's a joint, uh, joint universities at Yale, Princeton, MIT and UPenn. And $10 million grant over five years. And the high level message is, you 
when you tell us how to build a, a system of software layers in which there are specifications in each layer, in which the specifications flow through, that you can check across the layers that the whole system from the bottom to the top, including maybe even the hardware, you know, uh, is, you know, uh, conforms to some property, some, some, some proof that we want to prove by the system. <clears throat> it's a very, it's a very interesting goal. And, you know, the question is, like, how complex a piece of software can you do can you prove with this? Can you verify? They're using COP. So, again, it goes back to, we have automation at scale, and now we can start imagining the possibility that, in fact, we can apply it to large artifacts and actually verify large artifacts. Another expedition, this is an expedition out of Microsoft Research, again funded by Jeanette Witten just this year, called Everest. And Everest has a similar goal as a different strategy, but it also is very important. So Everest, the model here is, uh, you know, if you think about uh, internet communications, secure internet communications, you know, at the core of those communications is a protocol called TLS, which HTTPS is built, right? And implementations of TLS, including OpenSSL, Actually, are you know just loaded with bugs? It's amazing how many bugs are in this piece of software that's at the core of all internet security, right? Um, so why is that? Well, you know, it's hard to build the correct software, that's for sure. Um, you know, and the other problem is that even if you have TLS, so this is an example of where all the bugs are coming. There's crypto, there's uh, TLS in the protocol, there's uh, uh, different kinds of layers on top of that. Um, the takeaway here is that you know it's really hard to build this thing and make it you know make it. Correct in some sense. But the Everest expedition is going to do this. It's going to basically attempt to re implement the entire stack of the HTTPS uh, protocol uh, uh, in a verified framework. In particular, they're going to use F star uh, or, uh, or Dash as, as, the, as the basis on this. Um, and in the, meet, in, the, in the doing so, they're going to learn a lot of things. So the idea is to take all this buggy stuff and replace it with a drop in replacement, a piece of code that you can run on your desktop instead of. Open SSL, for example, and it will have these properties. Um, and they're, they're, you know, in the process, they're going to learn a lot about building things at scale. Um, this is built on top of existing work uh, called Ironclad, which is uh, building an operating system stack on top of Daphne. Um, also, uh, as I you know, mentioned, V3 uh, and Lean. Lean is a uh, uh, more as uh, a re implementation, it's probably the wrong word. It's, it's a next generation version of COP, which is a proof of system. So again, there, there's real opportunity here. This is, a, this is an ambitious project, but on the other hand, if you get this, then I can give you a, a, a component in your, in your stack that becomes you know, very hard for an attacker to, to attack. Okay, so let me just conclude. Um, I know I've run out a long time here. Um, I think it's important to understand where we are in history, okay? I think 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we will feel the effects of the things, that, the choice that we make today. Right? And in fact, I think looking back, the question we have to ask is, will, we, will the software, you know, the, the people who build the software infrastructure be seen as heroes? We, we built this amazing technology that empowered the world to do all these things, or be seen as villains? Where it's like, damn, if those guys had only given us you know, something better than C, right? If they could only, you know, if, that, if somebody had figured out a JavaScript was the wrong solution. Uh, so I think this is an important question, and you know, I'm, I'm not joking. I think this is a, we're at a pivotal time in history. Um, Disruptions are happening. They're just happening. There's no, no changing that. Smart objects are going to replace dumb objects. Um, you know, the, the, the projections, there's a bunch of projections. 20 billion smart devices by the year 2020. So, you know, every one of those devices, it's going to be really hard to update the software in those devices, right? Once they're there, once you have your smart port, there's probably very, you know, it, you know, it'd, be, it'd be hard to find a protocol to, to make it better. So, the, the, the code in the next five years will be there in our infrastructure. Uh, with us dealing with it for the next 50 years. Uh, as I said, our lives will depend on, the, on these objects. I mean, it, it's not like these are things that we can just, you know, you, if, if your computer doesn't work, you turn it off and you go about your business. But if everything around you doesn't, if your, if your car doesn't work, if your, if your heating system doesn't work, if your doorbell doesn't work, maybe the doorbell doesn't work. Um, the, the point is that we depend on these things. Okay, so a lot of people talk about the cathedral and the bizarre. So this is the classic. You know, do we use a monolithic software development process or do we use a community software process? I, I want to put a different cathedral analogy here, the cathedral of the skyscraper. Um, you know, historically, we have amazingly complex artifacts, you know, uh, operating systems, right? I mean, the Tesla is an amazing artifact. The fact that it does, it works, and it works for the most part. It, uh, but, but you have to look, it's heroic effort, amazing engineering, 
Uh, it's, it's not easy to scale that. It basically requires you to invest a huge amount of energy, right? You can't do that a thousand times, right? You don't have the talent, you don't have the time. But instead, really, what you want is the ability to build these skyscrapers quickly. And how do you do that? You build out of, uh, you know, correct materials, stronger materials, reusable components. And of course, you apply math. You basically use whatever tools you have to make sure that when you build them, it doesn't fall down. So in conclusion, I just want to talk about, you know, review the elements of the talk. You know, reasoning at scale is a key element. We, you know, we have created this technology. You know, we need to make it better. We need to understand, you know, how to, uh, where it fails and where it works. I, I think these projects that are taking, you know, a very aggressive view about what you can do with this technology are really important because they inform the future of how you build them. You know, I think we, I think we underestimate the value of reasoning about the code, of the data as well as the code. And so I, it's a challenge to the, to the community to think about the data too and how the data interacts. And there's definitely an overlap there with the problem of computer. You know, you know, I think, again, it's, you know, knowing about physics is hard, but on the other hand, I think more and more of the things that we build have a physical component, right? They're going to be flying around us, they're going to be, you know, understanding to take the sensor readings, et cetera. And so we need to build cyber physical systems. And finally, we need verified components. I think one of the key stepping stones here to a better future is to actually start thinking seriously about what it takes to make a piece of software as, as bug-free and as well you know, bulletproof as possible. And I think we, we're making small steps in that direction, but I think we also need to actually think about how to take it further. So with that, I'm done. Um, I, uh, I really want to appreciate uh, the feedback and the input that I got from many people and, of course, the writer's talk. Um, a number of things I talked about here I actually posted on Twitter. I have a Twitter account, so you can check that out. And I leave you with a little snippet from DPLDI, I think um, in the end, um, you know, we have to think the future is, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors and, you know, we as a community, one of the great things about automated reasoning is that we've resisted smoke and mirrors for many years, so I hope we continue to. So.
Yeah, no, I, I think it's a great question. I think, you know, so one of the, one of the goals of the talk is to try and inspire people to take the ideas that they work on to the end, to a specific vertical, right? Because then you can point to the effect, the effect you have on people and say, this is why we do what we do. It's not because we want a better programming language. It's because we can improve health outcomes or we can improve education outcomes. Uh, you know, Moshe Vardy, he gave a talk at the CCC symposium month ago, and he talked, he didn't talk about you know, logic or you know, formal methods, he talked about the fact that if self-driving cars come to be, it's going to put a lot of people out of work, and that's going to be a problem for society, okay? So I, I challenge everyone to think about real societal problems and try to bring them back to things that you do in the work you do, as, as your technical work you do. Um, I, so that's one dimension. I think the other dimension is, we do have, we have to tell a story. I mean, you know, there, there are, there, some people are good at it, some people aren't, uh, some people want to get involved in, you know, Washington, Washington politics, you know, a lot of people don't. I mean, there's this great Lispy, what's it stand for? Um, what is it? It's, uh, it's, it's, it, there's an institute where if you want to learn about science policy, uh, uh, Fred Schneider had basically had organized this on a regular basis, invites the technical people to come and learn about science policy uh, and, and contribute. Once you know more about how it works, you can actually do some really interesting things at the federal level, right? And unless we do that, you know, the, we're not going to be at the table. They're going to decide how to do software and cybersecurity assurance without anyone of our community there. So, I hope that you know, helps. something that doesn't contribute any real value to the society, um, you know, that's, that's where you get a lot of, you know, I'm not saying Facebook is like that, but what I'm saying is that, you know, the fact that you make money it does, not, does not necessarily mean that you're not introducing all kinds of technical problems in society that will later, you know, cause trouble. Um, I, you know, but again, these are difficult challenges. I mean, it's, it's not, it's a social problem. It's not just a technical problem. And I think being involved more at the, at the level of the discussion on what are the right policies around incentives, around uh, investment, around the community, as, about, as opposed to making money. I mean, these are, these are all important. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, I, I don't, I'm not the person to, to talk about those things. I can give one perspective, but I think as a community, we could benefit by paying more attention and maybe thinking about how to contribute to those areas. Yeah, so Have you heard about AlphaGo? Yeah, sure. Uh, like, yeah, okay. So this is essentially uh, DNN programming, right. the DNN Go, uh, which is basically not exclusively based on the method. Uh, oh, yeah, an extremely, extremely hard to follow. What's your take on where should we get the formal methods and try to ch uh, tackle much harder problems? Because SMT prepared for that is kind of easy to do. SMT? Yeah. 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 Ye
to this evening for an alphabet? Or? I'm prepared for beating you in a go. Well, you know, we can argue about that. That's great. Yes. We can talk about it over here. But let me just say the following. I think that I think there's an amazing and that opportunity. You know, you know, I, I'm a total believer in DNNs and and uh, and uh, you know AlphaGo, whatever. I think in the end they do things that are very useful and interesting, right? And I think one of the really interesting challenges is to connect the what they produce, like the output of my text in detail. Yeah, to something actually semantic content, right? Because so they don't know. I mean, they can make a move in, in, in Go. It's a game. Restricted set of things, and it could be a good move, bad move. Obviously, they train it up; it's a good move most of the time. Uh, but they can't prove anything about that move, right? Whereas you can imagine a system, you know, like Alex Ake was talking about. Um, what is it called? Um, uh, this thing that randomly generates instruction sequences. Anyway, the point is, what's it called? Stoke. Stoke. Yeah, Stoke. So he generates randomly generates instruction sequences, and he finds really good ones. They're super optimal, right? But you know, but in the process of generating, he can be much smarter about what he generates. So, so you can imagine the combination of generation using a DNN and you know a, a verification using, a, say, SFP. So I think I think there's a great opportunity. If you're not thinking about these things, you should be because that's definitely an important part of the business. Well, you made this, you made this uh, comment in response Very good work. Um, yeah, so, so let me say a couple of things. I think that the uh, um, you know, line design is important, but I think too, we have to take a different view on what the contribution our team is. Now, historically, academics have thought, you know, do something, and if it takes 10 years from now, it has influence, or 50 years from now, you know, it's still a contribution, right? It's great. But you have to realize, I have a different view on this. I think that we're at a critical point in history. This is a point in history that mankind has never been before. And it's you know unlikely to ever be it again, right? I think you know the fact is the global warming's happening. My kids are going to be in a position where the the ocean level is higher across the globe, and large large sheets of ice are melting literally in their life. Okay, so that doesn't happen every year. That you know that can't wait. A lot of what we do can't wait 50 years. So I do think that you have to ask yourself, you know, what's the strategy? I design a new language. I have some ideas, and it takes 50 years for it to catch on. Yeah, that might be a problem. So, so we do have to think either tactically about what we do for the kind of research we do and how we influence the research. I want to take one last question over here. Cool. Great. So uh, I'm curious about the utilization of this. So if you compare it to invest, for example, the building out the goal and the investment you put into this tool, are there any elections to be made for this? I honestly don't know if they'd like the size of the Alpha team, you know? Uh, I think it's like 20 to 30 people. Wow. Okay. That's a lot of people. That's a lot. Okay. Two. Well, I mean, three. Three for, for C3. So, um, but you know, again, it's, you know, I think measuring is sort of software output based on the numbers of people is probably a, a, a fool's game in the sense that, you know, it's, it's who are the people. Sometimes a very small group of people can do amazing things. Um, but I will say, I think, you know, it's, it's clear that if you invest more people and you say, this is what we're going after, you can do some amazing things. I have no doubt about that. And I think that's something our community has to think about. It's like, you know, right now the funding model for a lot of program management research is single PI, single, you know, sort of you know, three hundred thousand dollar grants. And there's there's only so much innovation you can do with that kind of funding. Um, so again, it goes back to the policies around how our research is funded and how we decide what to